Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next installment of FreeBSD Office Hours, uh, where developers and contributors and users get together and, and talk about topics of mutual interest and answer questions. I guess we can start with the first question we had uh, from the chat room from Ryan, was asking uh, if anyone has looked into uh, making a ZFS SQ light layer um, to, to improve the interface between SQLite and ZFS rather than just going via the file system. Uh, I don't think so, although there's been discussions about um, doing something similar for Postgres and having Postgres interface directly with ZFS either as an object store or at least with the, the DMU, the data management unit uh, in ZFS so that you didn't have the overhead of the, the POSIX file system layer. Um, but that would require quite a bit of additional programming on Postgres's side to use that interface instead of the interface that it commonly uses across all the different file systems that support it. As, as a side note, I thought I saw some, something about optimizing FreeBSD CFS or FreeBSD in general for uh... Yes. For uh, Postgres. Yes. Thomas Monroe. The other day. Yeah. Thomas Monroe's uh, got a couple of patches out for review, and I think one might already be committed now. Uh, one of them is for UFS, and it modifies the way the kind of read ahead cache works so that if you're reading and writing slightly behind as you update something, it uh, doesn't end up dropping the, the, the buffer, uh, the read ahead. Uh, so it made it, you know, deal with that particular use case slightly better and, and improve the performance there. Um, and then, yeah, he's worked, there's uh, some changes for ZFS uh, to be able to allow Postgres to provide more information to ZFS about what it intends to do with the file and, you know, whether you should try to keep this bit in cache or I definitely don't need this in the cache anymore and, uh, you know, or, you know, punch a hole in this file in this place or that type of thing. Uh, so another question uh, along the lines of not only uh, what? Oh. Uh, the question is, uh, will there be reports from the Code of Conduct Committee on its activities, like, you know, anonymized, aggregated, and so on? Uh, I think we've done that in the past, haven't we, Warner? Yeah, let me speak to that. Um, we've done that a little bit in the past. Um, recently, it's been fairly quiet. We've had um, up until this past weekend, um, there had only been one uh, non-serious complaint. Uh, more of a more of a rhetorical question after we published the COC. After this weekend, I think we have more to report about. So we'll probably um, report, um, but. The whole rest of this year, the complaints have been relatively infrequent. Um, and uh, so there hasn't really been much to actually report. But this month, we've definitely seen a big uptick. So I'll um, go through that as well. I'm transitioning my role away from the conduct board um, for this core team. Um, I want to focus my energies on other things. So we'll see what the new liaison and the conduct board does and how we'll structure that here in a couple months. But in the meantime, uh, we should report something at least to developers. Uh, and then Ryan has a follow-up question on the status of the Git transition. Maybe Ed or Warner want to talk a bit about that? So that, since Ed's not unmuting, um, I'll talk about it. But if Ed wants me to shut up, I will at any time. Um, so we've uh, translated the, the subversion tree and found some problems with that and are fixing those problems. Um, we've published uh, a, the uh, beta version of it so that people can try out different uh, workflows um, that they have been doing with subversion to see that they work with um, uh, the new Git tree. We're working on uh, having a, a primer. Ed just published a preliminary version of that, but it'll also, it's not so much a Git primer, but more of a how to use Git in FreeBSD 
so that we deal with things like, well, we've got an upstream that uses Git. How do we interact with that? Um, basically, what replaces vendor branches? And then we have an upstream that doesn't use Git. How do we interact with that and have advice for that? So that is, you know, different people come and go um, from the project or their interest shift. Different people can import uh, newer versions of um, software and kind of know basically what to expect and have the exceptions documented in a stylized way. And so we're hoping to roll that out. Um, we've been working with the release engineer uh, so that 12.2 uh, uh, will be built um, out of Git and, as opposed to out of Subversion. Um, and so we're hoping to make the transition later this summer, hopefully in July, so that um, the entire 12.2 release process, um, uh, you know, it will be under Git. Uh, the only other thing to add is we're looking at ways of exporting um, the tree on a read-only basis to Subversion. Um, but uh, it's easy to do an export. It's harder to do an export that is consistent with uh, the history. So like the R numbers would change. That's easy, but making it with the R numbers don't change, that might be harder. So we may be pulling uh, for uh, you know community uh, need for that if it turns out to be um, something uh, difficult. We just started looking at that problem. So is there anything I forgot, Ed? I think that's uh, pretty covers uh, covers the important points. Um, I think one of the main things that we need to get sorted out in the very near term is get some snapshot uh, builds done from Git and make it um, easier for uh, for people to test those results and start getting uh, feedback on what does or doesn't work. Uh, so the next question actually kind of morphed into two or three questions, but uh, is there a recommended way of using FreeBSD update across a fleet of hosts uh, besides hitting each one individually? Uh, in general, there's a, a cron tab mode in FreeBSD update that will you know, fetch all the updates uh, and then it's just a matter of installing them. Um, that can be done somewhat in an automated fashion. Uh, for example, um, the first boot scripts that run on Amazon that Colin built uh, will actually run FreeBSD update the first time the VM boots so that it will make sure any security updates that uh, have come out since the image was created get installed. Um, so it can be done headless. Um, part of that depends on how your ETC files might have changed and uh, issues that that might pose. Uh, but I guess that led into the question about the status of package base. Uh, can Ed talk a bit about that? I know that uh, there's been work going on uh, on package base with uh, Emmanuel Vido and Ed and some others, um, but I don't have a good status update on that right now. Yeah, uh, Ed, um, Ed's distracted with stuff um, yes. at home a little bit. So um, yeah. we might need to circle back to that when he's a little more uh, available and can give a longer answer. I, I can't help you or I would give one. Yeah, uh, I think the same goes for uh, the status of ARM becoming tier one. I know, Warner, you've been working on that a little bit on defining what tier one means, uh, but not necessarily yeah, on the ARM bits. Difficulties with making ARM tier one is it causes a lot of angst um, among different people in the project because they don't know what that means. What is the project asking them to do? Are they asking them to do a lot of extra work? And so to uh, figure out what kind of the shared expectation is across the project, I've started putting together a document that I'll be circulating more widely to um, you know help us understand that and then that will let us um, you know do kind of a cost side for the cost benefit of doing arm uh, 64 tier one which um, we think will have a lot of benefit um, there's some costs and we need to have that discussion and this is a piece of that discussion so we can have it um, a little bit more uh, sanely and not get too many things conflated and have tempers flare so. Um, 
and maybe we can get a more substantial update on that later. Uh, the next question was, is there any plans to deal with deprecated tools like older versions of Java and Python in ports and the packages that are going to expire because of that in the next few months? Uh, there was a bit of a discussion on IRC about that um, before the call started, but uh, Nicholas, do you know more, or maybe Steve, about what's going I on with that? I think Steve is better to answer, but okay. in, yeah, Uh, we can't hear Steve. He unmuted, but there's no sound. <laughs> but I definitely think the the Python two stuff is is going to maybe kill off more than we expected, and, yeah. and maybe we need to uh, slow that down a little bit. Or... Yeah, I, I mean, for I would assume for the Python two stuff that even if Python two is is deprecated and even has an expiration date, maybe. I haven't looked that we want the uh, new Python 2 until most, if not all, of the users are are migrated. Uh, I know when I last updated my system, there was a bunch of uh, messages about ports using the deprecated Python 2. I think at least Gecko ports uses Python 2 somewhere in the build. Well, I think there's... Like that. In... I'm pretty sure there have been hundreds of leaf ports that have been deleted yeah. uh, already. Um, yeah, because... there, there, there has been leaf ports deleted for sure, but I guess that was either because there was no upstream effort to, to migrate them to Python 2 or because they were fairly small leaf ports. Uh, nuking, for instance, Firefox and stuff like that would cause a bit of a problem. So I think they will stick around even if uh, if they require Python or and Python 2 will stick around even if it requires even if it's uh, end of life properly. Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you now, Steve. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I mean, it really does come down to upstream, you know, unfortunately, I don't think a lot of us volunteering on the ports project, you know, have time to delve in and do security maintenance on things like Python 2. Um, so if someone were willing to commit to, say, pulling patches in from other vendors, you know, we could talk about that. Um, I know Red Hat in particular is maintaining Java. Um, I don't know if anyone is maintaining Python. Maybe the Ubuntu folks are. Maybe Red Hat is. Um, Red Hat. But someone would have to, you know, pull those patches in. I think we'd have to have someone really willing to do that work and then we can talk about keeping it around. I I would guess that Red Hat has patches for, for Python 2 because they usually keep fairly old versions of things supported for some time. But the next question is there is probably are they willing to share the patches? Well the Red Hat patches are going to be out there in their in their uh, in the CentOS uh, source repos yeah. if nothing else. You could go fetch them, but it's work. Yeah, and you know uh, their job's slightly easier because nothing else in their package set changes. Uh, yeah. Whereas you know we don't get to move the ports tree kind of in lockstep like they do. Wait, uh, there. I, I'm looking at fresh ports right now. If we're talking specifically about Python two, there's I mean there are some heavy heavy hitters like VirtualBox, uh, yeah, Thunderbird, and I I think all the Gecko ports Thunderbird was just version lift list uh, stuff like that and then there's a whole bunch of various pipe ports and i think that could be things that are also available as a python 3 yeah. uh, package but fresh ports list them anyway for the java ones i'm wondering you know how old of java do people still need and how many apps are depending on it like most of my Java apps were fine going up to 12 and 13, although we did run into a couple of uh, things where we needed to change the Java source slightly to make it work. But... So if people have more input or questions about the deprecation of old Java and Python, uh, put it in the chat room and we'll maybe circle back to that. Uh, yeah. But I did want to touch on Steve's other question was about uh, managing changes to things in base and specifically when a utility or program changes its arguments and how do we tell that programmatically? 
it's been a, an issue I've run into with ZFS writing uh, scripts to handle replication as how do I tell both from both sides of the replication, you know, does that one support the new compressed send feature uh, and this other send feature? Or uh, even at one point, ZFS changed the progress, or the when you asked for an estimate of how big a replication stream is going to be, at one point, the output moved from standard error to standard out. And so your script had to look for it in a different place. Uh, and there wasn't necessarily an easy way to query the, the ZFS command line tool and be like, hey, you know, what's going on here? Doesn't uname have a um, way to find out what the user land version that you're running is and can yes. see off that? I mean, it's, uh, crude somewhat... and it's crude and as all heck, but it's beats uh, nothing unless you can somehow craft uh, ZFS commands that are harmless or at least item potent to what you want done. Well, I think uh, in this case, Steve was actually thinking about a, a beehive change, uh, like uh, even trying to query, does this version of beehive support suspend and resume yet? Which oh. uh, as an extra complication right now, that feature is in head, but it's behind a, a source.conf flag. So you have to opt into it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At some point, we can make you know the current dot features or whatever for it, but that's one of the things that makes it harder. Current dot features was made for stuff like that that may or may not be there. But then, how do we make that uh, something that upstreams like libvirt know exists <laughs> uh, and things like that? Uh, and yeah, it's an interesting problem. Uh, it also gets into. You know, uh, with the ZFS ones, you could somewhat go based on what release, but then, you know, ZFS is also cross platforms now. Uh, you know, where there's a version for Windows, Mac, Linux, FreeBSD, and Lumos, and uh, until recently, all of them had a different set of features. Uh, now, the the FreeBSD and Linux ones are are going to have feature parity, which will help a lot. But um, they almost raised the question of kind of like how ZFS has the concept of feature flags for indicating what features the ZFS tools support for the on-disk format of the pool, if you almost need something like that for like the command line interface. And you know, does this, uh, like another feature that ZFS got at one point was uh, when using ZFS set to set a, pr a property, eventually that was extended so you could set multiple properties in, in one command. Uh, and you're like, do I have a new enough version of ZFS that lets me do that? Uh, part of this is is uh, going to be solved upstream now that ZFS is basically going to go to, you know, being Open ZFS version 2.0 and then, you know, 2.1 or 3.0 or whatever, uh, will maybe give you s some way to to tell. But how do we do that in maybe a more generalized way across? many tools in FreeBSD, like Beehive and ZFS and something else. And is there some way that's uh, discoverable and, and useful across a lot of different utilities? Yeah, that's, that, that's an interesting and clean uh, notion. Uh, we don't have that right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and traditionally, it's something we've maybe been able to cover with release notes or whatever. but. Even that's not necessarily a great way. And like you said, the U name capital U to find the version of the user space. Uh, but then again, we don't bump that when we change just the command line interface of Beehive. We generally have only bumped that when we've changed the kernel ABI. Yeah, some people have. I mean, when I've removed certain files in Right. Uh, like include files and stuff, I'll bump it, but uh, it's not part of the project's DNA to think to do that for things like additions of arguments to commands. Right, because in general, you think of those additions as not a backwards incompatible change, uh, but you don't want things like libvirt having to grok the, the usage statement in order to figure out if a feature is there. Exactly. And FreeBSD version isn't about 
incompatible changes. It's just about changes because, you know, if you're trying to run on a particular version, you know things about that particular version. Um, and this helps you know more at a finer level um, because bumps to FreeBSD version are cheap. Right. So uh, apart from having to rebuild your kernel, I think that's the... Right. Uh, and, re and rebuilding all your ports. A uh, small inconvenience, <laughs> hardly worth it. Well, and you can also imagine the, the documented list of what each of those ABI versions means could get uh, quite a bit bigger if, if we were doing a better job of bumping it every time we change something. And documenting exactly what the change is, because right now a lot of the versions are, you know, bump FreeBSD version to deal with the said change. Yeah. That's helpful, but which said change? Yeah. Uh, and if you're lucky, you'll get an R version, uh, you know, said change R, blah, blah, blah. This mm -hmm. just reinforces my opinion that FreeBSD version is actually mostly useless even in kernel. For instance, for RTLD, I provide a very different way to differentiate RTLD version and features it provides specific symbols when some feature that is not otherwise discoverable is added to RTLD. You can imagine uh, doing a lot of things when you have things when you have some user mode utility. For instance, you can have a flag that just uh, lists the features that you uh, can optionally have and that were added from time to time. You can have something more mechanically discoverable, like, again, you can just export an elf symbol from the binary and then parse it using the standard binary to, uh, maintain, maintenance tools, bin utils. You can do a lot of stuff there and do it uh, at a place where you need, instead of trying to um, define some generic scheme that actually doesn't fit each piece where you need it. FreeBSD version is example, basically an example of the failed uh, ex experiment. That case by case and do it as you need and when you need, and that's all. Yeah, and that was a bit the way I was leaning with uh, the ZFS command line thing was adding a command like ZFS API or ZFS CLI that would output a list of basically feature flags that are like the symbols you mentioned that should specify, you know, this version has these changes against whatever the original baseline was. Uh, but then the question was, how do we, you know, do we occasionally reset that baseline to avoid that list getting overly long or? or what is the problem with the list getting too long? Uh, the, not uh, that much other than just uh, getting cluttered. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm of the opinion that having a long list is not a problem. Actually, another thing that I can uh, think of is other features actually implemented in libraries like libzfs or whatever support library is used by the CLI tools. If yes, you can just look for the symbol that is used to implement this feature. Then you would know is it present or not. Yeah, that's maybe a little harder to do from from a shell script that does ZFS verification. But in general, that that is uh, that makes sense. That is actually very easy to do from the shell script. Okay. Just an M or redel for object dump, uh, lib right. ZFS, and then see, grab for the symbol. It is one liner. Yeah, uh, that approach covers almost all of the changes except for small things like, you know, when the status output moved from one file descriptor to another, but those are kind of edge cases that we don't need to spend too much time worrying about. Uh, so the next question was about the status of BECTL, uh, the boot environment manager uh, on FreeBSD. Uh, says that he's seen some documentation stating that it's still experimental uh, compared to the BEADM shell scripts. 
Um, I think that documentation is old now. Uh, BECTL is feature complete and is what most people are using now uh, and is uh, working well and is growing additional features uh, already. I think uh, Kyle's in the chat room and maybe can even speak a little bit more about uh, his plans for the future of BECTL. Uh, but it is compatible with uh, whatever BEADM was doing before. Uh, and I think it's past feature complete at this point. Uh, there was also a question earlier about uh, when someone sees patches languishing in Bugzilla or Fabricator, uh, what are some recommended actions besides posting bump comments? That's um, a good question. There's been some discussion on IRC, and I won't, uh, I won't be able to read that one and talk here at the same time, but uh, from my perspective, if it's if it's a port or something that's maintained, you might be able to drop an email to the maintainer. Uh, sure, send it. Was, and if it's if it's more general ports, or if you submitted a uh, a patch for for a port you maintained, uh, sending a message to the ports mailing list is. It's a it's a it, it's a way to get someone to to uh, perhaps have a look. Unfortunately, that leads a bit to you know the person who shouts the highest or the loudest uh, gets the attention. But uh... yeah, in, are are you done? In, 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 in some uh, one second, in some cases, at least for force maintainer updates, we're on the port side. We are. A bit understaffed, so and, yeah. Okay, go yeah. ahead, Warner. Yeah, we have a. There's a couple of issues at play. One is that patches can come in in a number of different ways, yeah. either through Fabricator or through Mozilla, or sometimes as pull requests on GitHub, uh, and so that defocuses developer time. I have to go look at here, I have to look at here, I have to look at here, and go searching for things. Um, uh, Mark Linneman does a really good job on the things that come into Bugzilla of getting them to the right people. Um, these people may be busy um, and, and so forth. And we don't, so here's kind of where tooling starts to come in. We don't have a good way right now to indicate, yeah, this port looks good. I hope it compiles or you know this change looks good i hope it compiles um or you know those sorts of things uh so i think steve has done so, some work to to actually i think it's steve uh to to build and test patches as they come in and once once he's done that or i guess it's automated he's posting a small this build series to log yeah we, we need to bring that to 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 uh, the source tree, uh, but the other problem, um, people in IRC are hitting it exactly on the head. We're understaffed for people willing to land patches. Now there is a little bit of friction in the tooling and we can reduce some of that friction. Um, and there's some easy cases we could optimize, but the, the bottom line is that, you know, the number of people that we have that are looking at patches um, is far smaller than the number of people we need given the patches that come in. And we need to solve that problem, I think, two ways. One, by making it a little more efficient so that, you know, those people's time and effort goes farther. But also, um, we need more people or more ways of, uh, for obscure areas of the system of uh, streamlining, uh, roping people in or making sure that things don't fall on the floor somehow. And, and that's kind of an open area for the project to, uh, enhance and improve. Uh, can I mention one other thing that I've been thinking about as far as that goes, um, which is, uh, you know, we have overlay support in Poudreau now, um, which I think could enable a lot of new interesting workflows, um, particularly in terms of, uh, like, you know, we have the the GNOME repo, for example, now, and we have the, the KDE repo. You know, folks are kind of working off in a corner and then kind of merging things in. And I think there's a lot of room to take advantage of the overlays to kind of split the tree up and move some things out so that people can do things without uh, sort of running into roadblocks. 
uh, if that makes sense. Was well, someone working on X when I looked at the the overlays? Uh, it it feels like you when you're working on large more infrastructure ish or at least large family of ports. Uh, it's it's not as you, you usually want the whole ports tree uh, anyway. And I mean, at least the GNOME team, the KDE team, the XR team and stuff like that. We have port streams, ports trees on GitHub where we can accept patches. Uh, and then the problem becomes getting those patches from, from that port tree into, uh, uh, into the subversion port tree. But uh, for that process, I'm hoping that the uh, Git conversion will will stream the stream stream streamline that process because then you can work in your uh, in your uh, your team repository or even your own repository for your own course and just submit pull requests and hopefully those can be easier merged for at least my workflow when I pick up a patch for a port from from a Bugzilla, I need to fetch the patch, I need to apply it, I might need to build it in Pujir if Swills hasn't been there already, and then I need to commit it. And having having something that I can just click a button, and get it to, to my tree, build it, and then merge it would make that much easier. And would also mean that there's less, less waste than a, that I can screw up uh, applying the patch or merging the wrong thing and stuff like that. So I, at least I hope that on the port side, when having the FreeBSD repository in Git and having a good workflow for uh, how to manage that would will will help at least uh, partially with the situation. Yeah, it was, uh, there's some similar stuff for docs that I'd like to see, uh, so that more documentation changes can be. I can look at the proposed change, see that it's fine, and. Automation already told me, you know, that doesn't break the doc build. And here you can look at a rendered version of it to make sure it displays correctly uh, and that type of thing. Whereas now, you know, even if it's somebody with a relatively short, you know, two line change to the documentation, it can take half an hour for me to actually pull that down from Bugzilla or Fabricator or whatever, build and test it, make sure it looks right, do all the stuff to be able to commit it. Whereas, you know, in some ideal future, I can review it, uh, check the outputs, and press a button, and now uh, it goes into the repo. Yeah, what, that's one of the hopes for source as well, that some of the simpler changes can pass a regression test and ha have all that be done in the background and offline. I mean, even if we take a week to get GAT passed or GAT failed, that's a hell of a lot better than uh, what we're doing now, which is letting patches languish for years. Not that I think it'll take a week and not that we can't do smart things with patching, yada, yada, yada. But that's one of the things that we're also hoping that Git, the, the Git cutover will enable because there's a lot more tools for that sort of thing. Um, and also we can potentially enable, if we publish the tools we use, we can uh, allow developers to kind of pre-run uh, the, the test, so they know that it's good, and when the, by the time they show up and get developer attention, um, it can be a useful exchange on substantive issues. Um, there's talk about highlighting uh, style issues, um, and there's talk about highlighting you know build failures and test failures and those sorts of things. And I think um, at least highlighting those things would be um, very useful for our you know submitters to say, oh, I need to go fix that or whatever and we don't have you know a person in the loop to have a long round trip time to get these things um nailed down and it might reduce the friction some so that's some of the tooling yep. we're hoping will come in the future to you know make things uh, a little bit better for sure getting that uh even the initial feedback that you know while the submitter maybe did the tests on their machine or whatever in a clean environment the results were slightly different or whatever but anything that uh, is a roadblock to getting committed if we can get a response to the user that doesn't take a bunch of developer time uh, that increases the, you know right. getting and, them that feedback and that by the time a developer looks at it it's 
in a more ready to land state. Yeah, and the project doesn't have to necessarily do this with all its resources on its own. You know, there's right. a number of things like Cirrus CI, Travis CI, that we can push branches to particular places and then that will cause the um, stuff to run. And, you know, we can leverage other people's machines and other people's infrastructure in addition to our own and have our own be more of a orchestrator rather than a prime mover in some of these things as well. And I think looking at that can also help the efficiency of the project without, you know, compromising, um, you know, the fact that we have, you know, that we're an OS project and we run our own OS to develop the OS in a lot of ways. If some of these run other OSs, you know, that's fine. That shows that we can coexist in virtualization environments as well, which is also useful for the project, um, even outside of the benefit we get from, um, you know, a better quality of patch input to the developer's uh, attention time, so. Yeah, it's like uh, we use the Cirrus CI for the, the papers.freebsd.org repo. So that when mm -hmm. someone I proposes uh, a change, we make sure that it's not going to break the build of the website. Uh, and that happens all in automation with automatic feedback. So uh, if somebody does have a mistake in the in the code there, they find out about it before I get around to reviewing it and, and merging it and making sure yeah, those I'm, changes go to the repo. I'm 50-50 on my submissions there. But I knew right away. And I also didn't have to set up the whole environment um, for papers. Mm -hmm. I made my change, and then I got the feedback. Oh, I did this wrong, and then I made the next change, and oh, it worked. And then somebody got it and committed it later that day yeah. um, once I got that going. So that was, um, I think that's a, a good thing, and that's something the project can learn from and needs to learn from uh, to, you know, be viable going forward. We're, you know, at a time of recession worldwide due to the coronavirus, um, which it, I think is going to be a net negative for people, uh, people's time working on the project. Um, so anything that we can do to help streamline it or, you know, have human effort have greater effect, I think is going to be uh, a good thing. Um, the one thing as we move into these things is we need to be clear on communications for what's expected, when it's expected, and how to use the new tool so that we don't get a bunch of people showing up at the same time saying, hey, you said we're using Git and I don't understand what to do now. I can't commit. I'm going to go away. Or um, it's a big support load. So we need to, there needs to be balance, but we also need to move quickly uh, as well into, into this area so that we can get these benefits. Yeah, as you know, one of the things uh, so kind of related to one of the questions from the chat room, which was, uh, what's a good way for users to confirm uh, that official documentation is up to date or suggest when it isn't? Uh, and that's one of the projects I've been working on is trying to move our documentation away from the the older doc book format that required users to learn XML and also kind of not really a doc book problem, but the the documentation in FreeBSD had a very strict style guide of it only being 72 columns wide, not 80, which just messed with other things. And uh, strictness about things like two spaces after a period, uh, which in the rendered version of the website doesn't actually even display that way, so it doesn't matter, <laughs> um, was just more and more friction for that. And so getting to the point where if you happen to spot even a small mistake, in the FreeBSD documentation, where you'd be able to click the little edit icon in the top corner, suggest your change, uh, have that automation around it, and, and reduce the friction to the FreeBSD doc team to just, you know, this is a, a correct addition or, or change and not just, you know, defacement of the website or something, uh, then I think that can get us a long way towards getting the FreeBSD documentation back to. The, the quality that it has a reputation for, which has been languishing a bit the last number of years. Uh, you know, some of that is my fault. I put a bunch of effort in and, and got the ZFS chapter up to date, but I've not been maintaining it since then. Yeah, for documentation, both having a easier way to update and submit patches, even as someone who's worked a decent amount of time in, in docs, Every time I have to do something, you have to figure out how did I do this, and it's it's fairly cumbersome. Having making it easier to uh, to update would be a huge benefit to the project. 
Um, I also think regards to documentation in general, we have to realize as as developers and computer people and stuff like that that documentation is a is a living thing and it's something that you need to maintain. It's not just write once and forget. Uh, similar way as our code needs to be maintained, the documentation needs to be maintained. Yeah, uh, and I think the other thing that uh, the doc working group is trying to address is that people consume documentation in different ways and we have different consumers of our documentation. So while the FreeBSD handbook in its kind of textbook style uh, is useful and it's kind of like the operator's manual, uh, you probably also need slightly more informal documentation in the form of like how to's and tutorials and, and quick start guides. But also, you know, we do need to still have things like the, you know, the architecture handbook developer doc stuff that's much, much more detailed and is into, you know, this is how the source code works and stuff, uh, or this is how this architecture uh, works or this PMAP and so on. Um, and finding a way to structure those different types of documentation so that they're accessible and discoverable, but specifically so that if you're an end user and you're trying to figure out some, you know, I want to install this application on my Raspberry Pi, you don't end up in the architecture handbook learning about implementation details of ARM that are not going to be useful to you. And so trying to figure out how to structure our documentation so that we can support the, the different uh, use cases for the documentation and the different consumers of the documentation, but in a way where it's all consumable. And then uh, Coding Cowboy says that we need pictures. <laughs> um, one of the reasons why the, the project to convert the docs went with ASCII doc rather than just pure markdown was so that we wouldn't lose the few things we have like diagrams with annotations. Uh, but we still get the ability that people can write new docs in just Markdown and it'll work, but we wouldn't lose uh, all the kind of contextual and, and semantic information that people have put into uh, the existing handbook. Although I don't know how many people would choose to continue to do that. I'm, I would certainly like to include more diagrams um, when I document different things. So, because uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, you know, um, Code Cowboy is right. Um, Coding Cowboy is right about that. So, um, and right now it's, I'm going to go with uh, somewhat more difficult than excruciating to, to, to do that. Um, I did it once a really long time ago, I think, but I don't, wouldn't have the first idea where to start today. So. I like I like the idea that ASCII doc would let me do that, either inside ASCII doc directly, so I don't need to use another tool, or using another tool if ASCII doc was insufficient somehow for what I was trying to do. I like that a lot. Alan, can I ask Alan and um, Benedict? Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, so the ASCII doc conversion of doc of the uh, handbook, what? Uh, what are, sort of timeline are we looking at to cutting over there? Or do we, ha do, do we have a plan to get to a timeline? What's, what's kind of the status there? Maybe it might be a better question. So my work had kind of stalled, although recently, um, somebody, who was it? Uh, Harrison Grundy had uh, revived his work to help me finish the tool that does the conversion. So um, we have a conversion. It's mostly OK, but it's mangled things. Like if there was a line break in the title line of the chapter, when we converted it, the space got lost and two words got smushed together. Um, but you know, those are things that we can, you know, it will just highlight how nice the process is for people to help us clean those up after the fact. So maybe we don't want to stall too much on that. Um, there's that. And then uh, recently, I think it was Salvatore uh, worked on converting the the content of the the regular FreeBSD website uh, to uh, Hugo Markdown, and I think with his help we can get that doc project back on track uh, and moving forward again. Um, yeah, I think at some point we just have to do the cutover and uh, 
deal with cleanup afterwards. Uh, we don't want, you know, uh, we don't have to tear down the old website for the handbook right away. Uh, and we can, you know, just get towards getting everything updated. Uh, so yeah, maybe a little bit more bias towards flipping the switch rather than trying to get it uh, good before we, we do that. Uh, another question for Alan, is there any plans to, to move to Git at the same time as doing the conversion or, or those separate things? Um, well, I think on the current timeline, uh, the project is expecting to move to Git in the next you know five or six weeks. Uh, yeah. So uh, yes, it was always predicated on using Git just because that allowed that workflow of you know you click the little pencil icon and it would it would create the the pull request with your change and allow us to review it. Yeah, getting back to your earlier remarks, Alan, I would uh, bias away from having the perfect being the enemy of the good. So do it and clean things up um, and, and let, get more people looking at it, more people submitting things, especially once we get to Git and doing that is simple and easy. And maybe um, having some kind of uh, project-wide PR where both inside the developers and in the doc group, as well as for our users say, hey, this is the new version and we want it to be really good by 12.2 release or 13 release or something, which is at the end of the year, you know, spend five minutes and do this and, 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 and try to draw some people in that way. And maybe we can also hook some recruits to do more extensive work in the docs, document space if they find that that's easy. Right. Just a suggestion. I don't have time to make any of that happen. But yeah, uh, I agree that maybe just having a hackathon around getting it finished uh, and get some people to be able to spend a bit of time on it and, and do it uh, would, you know, like we've said a number of times, perfect is the enemy of good here. At some point, we just deal with the fact that not everything's perfect and go through cleaning it up a bit at a time. Uh, Edward asked about the outcome of the FreeBSD 2020 community survey. I think we just started looking at the results for that, and I guess we uh, Core 11 will post something about that uh, once they've had time to digest it. Uh, yeah, Sean Chitterton um, did that survey uh, and ran it and posted some preliminary results on the Core channel, which I think um, he was planning on sharing a little more, uh, sharing a little bit more widely. I mean, it was like one or two screenshots, so you know, there's almost no uh, data there. Um, you know, to brag that, okay, it's done, we can talk about this. And so when things settle down and there's enough bandwidth in core to talk about it and we're not dealing with other issues, um, I think we'll talk through it and get it, get the results published and, um, you know, see what the data tells us about who's using the pro product or, you know, who's using our um, OS and what uh, the project can learn from that about maybe doing things differently or doing different things or what have you. So um, so yeah, the results will be published soon. We've had a little bit of a mess this past weekend. We need to clean up uh, and that's gonna take some time. So probably once Core 11 is completely transitioned to in July is the time frame people should expect uh, the results to start coming out. I have a completely different question on a completely different topic. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, apart from the from these uh, office hours and stuff like that, uh, considering the pandemic situation, has there been any attempt from anyone in the community to host uh, virtual uh, hackathons? Uh, so my user group has done their meeting online a few times. Uh... I think our one two weeks ago or so, uh, Warner and John Baldwin were able to join us uh, and some other people, and that was nice. Um, my company did a small hackathon uh, recently, and uh, Steve was there. We worked on uh, a number of Bugzilla things we found, and uh, Steve was showing off the work he's been doing on a FreeBSD native Slack client. Uh, so that was fun. 
Uh, but yes, I'd really like to do like the uh, after BSD can hackathon we did in Kitchener uh, last year uh, that Litterman is talking about. I that was very nice. Uh, I wish I had planned my time around that hackathon a little better. Uh, we drove uh, from the city where I live to the hackathon each of the three days, and that ate up a number of the useful hours of time we would have spent on hacking if we had just stayed in, in Kitchener for the hackathon. Although after being at BSD Can for a week and a bit, I did like the idea of sleeping in my own bed uh, for those extra nights. Great. It might be something to, to look into hosting some sort of virtual hackathon or squashing weekend or something since we yeah. we currently can't do it in real life, so to speak. Yeah, uh, I do think that's would be a good idea. And you know, maybe spinning that off into a couple of different groups, like uh, uh, you know, one for the doc things, and maybe one for uh, some port stuff, and and just general bug bug squashing stuff. Like uh, I fixed uh, a bug in the MD5 slash SHA256 command in FreeBSD, where if you fed it the input from standard in instead of a file, uh, the dash C flag was just ignored instead of it's supposed to allow you to say the expected checksum is this and exit with an error if it's not. And that didn't work if you fed it input from standard input uh, rather than feeding it a file on the command line. Uh, and somebody pointed that out in a bug and I managed to uh, fix it. Although as happens many times with these bugathons, it turns out the bug is not quite as easy as it looks to fix. <laughs> uh, but we did get it figured out. Bugs have a tendency to do that. Yeah. Although the one was pretty easy. It was just uh, removing a, a, a check in ZFS uh, that was preventing you from using certain checksums on a boot pool because the bootloader didn't support it. But the bootloader has since gained support, and we had never taken that check out. I think there was, was there one more question in the chat room? No. Well, there is one now, at least. Could libmd be accelerated, uh, e.g., with a AES dash ni? Uh, sure. So with AES and I, no, that doesn't uh, actually apply to the I, I, the CPU support for accelerated SHA at two and so on are a separate feature. But similarly, um, so. LiveMD currently uses Colin Percival's implementation, which was faster than the previous one, uh, but does not currently take advantage of some of the AVX uh, and so on that it could. Um, I looked at using, Intel has a library called ISA-L, I think is the one I'm thinking of, that has accelerated SHA and basically uses the AVX vector instructions to improve it. Um, but the assembly is in a dialect that our compiler doesn't support. We'd have to import Yasm or something. Uh, and there's some been some talk about doing something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, it would be good uh, if LibMD could import uh, and make use of those. Yeah, we hacked the build system at work to use Yasm from ports. But our, uh, our hack is very hackish. But we use it exactly for that. We use it so we can use the Intel ISL libraries, which are written in the Yasm, Masm dialect of assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, yeah, it'd be nice uh, to compare that. Uh, so Colin says that his SHA-256 code, which is from the FreeBSD kernel, and I updated libmd to use it, or the other way around? I don't know. Colin made one of them faster, and I made it so that both the kernel and user land both use the newer version. Ah, he says, not the version in FreeBSD, uh, because you have to uh, do the right stuff to save and restore the FPU if you're going to use the AVX stuff. Um, John Mark Gurney had written some of the stuff for that, uh, including like the figuring out if the CPU supported it to enable it and so on. Uh, it would be good to get that finished. I just haven't had time. Uh, there are many other things that need my attention more. Um, but if somebody 
is into that, it'd be really helpful. Uh, but if somebody is interested in working on the uh, AVX accelerated SHA stuff, uh, or even just, you know, basically importing Collins stuff from libc Percival into into libmd and the, the FreeBSD kernel, um, I can also dig up the link uh, for John Mark's stuff that does the FPU save and restore and uh, that to help them get bootstrapped on that. And yes, as, as Mark Linderman says, it's not the technology that holds us back, it's our personal organization, or lack thereof. All right, uh, we're running up to the end of our hour. Uh, is there maybe one last question? Someone asked earlier if Ed was around to answer or give us some sort of status update on uh, package base, since he wasn't around when we first talked about it. But I don't think he is. I am. Uh, right. uh, oh. Awesome. So I have been exploring and playing with package base a little bit, but I am not um, an expert uh, on it by any means yet. Um, so really, we should get Kyle um, or Manu to uh, to weigh in here as well. Um, my understanding is, and my experience so far has been that it broadly works the um uh from a very high level um it, you know it's it's functional uh what we really need is to get um people using it and finding um corner cases and odd um uh odd misbehavior or such um and there's some work that needs to be done in package uh, still to kind of make a um, from the the user experience um, perspective to make it convenient and um, uh, usability improvements. But um, I know there are a number of developers who are updating their uh, main laptops on a uh, regular basis, um, exclusively via package base today. Is there a wiki page or how to or something that explains how to get started? running package space for a current or something yeah there is a wiki um uh, uh package base page that um talks about how to convert from an existing installation into package base um and update it um and i i believe it is entirely up to date um one of my uh goals in the midterm uh future is to set up a um a prototype package base build um and distribution uh, environment like so that, yeah so that folks who want to explore it can get a version of current um easily from the uh from a pre-built set yes that would be uh, a good first step since you know, i don't favor building it on my laptop <laughs> Okay then, uh, did anybody have anything else before we wrap up? Okay, uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining us here and in the chat room uh, and uh, keep an eye on the office hours wiki page uh, for the next time slot. And if you have any suggestions on topics or if you would like to volunteer to host so I don't have to, uh, do get in touch. All right, thank you, Alan, for hosting these. Thanks, Alan, for, for running this and getting it all set up. Yeah, thanks.